Okay. Um, very happy to be with you this morning. And uh, I'd like to begin by, you know, when we talk about Lectio Divina, um, I heard he just had a, an introduction with scripture. Uh, it was Dr. Wall. And he talked a lot about John. Did he get into Revelations? No. Next time. Okay, very good. Love that. Um, good. That's next time. You, 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 go to, you go to seminary and you just expect it to be one of the things that you automatically cover. Um, and it, uh, like we had to wait, like I had to wait to go to the seminary for seven years before we got to book Revelations. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it took a long time. Um, but when we talk about prayer, there are certain uh, general principles and rules that every Catholic needs to know and be able to really expound upon to other people. Uh, for, so first and foremost, I just want to, you know, again, by way of introduction, let me talk about the three ways that the church prays. Three ways that the church prays. Number one is vocal. And this, again, we see this in many different shapes and forms, but it, it takes a very spiritual and theological perspective. Just simply on the fact that you look to the Old Testament prophets, and they were told to prophesy to the nations. They were told not only to give the witness of their uh, of their own lives, but also of voice. And we look at the apostles, and how on the day of Pentecost, they were given um, not hands or feet of fire, they were given tongues of fire. They were told to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God, just as Jesus did. Our voices, and especially when we sing at Mass, they give a cause for creation, the creation, something that God has given to us, our created mouths, the voice that we have, to give praise and glory back to the Creator. Everything should point back to God. Everything should point back to God. So when we talk about praying vocally, obviously this can take shape um, in a very individual sense, when we pray uh, just by ourselves. Um, it can also take the shape of when we pray communally uh, at the Mass. This is the highest form of vocal prayer that we know of. Number two, do we have any guesses? No, the song deals with vocal. Oh, sorry. Meditation. Meditation. Now, when most of the world hears the word meditation, it's the lotus position, <laughs> one with the universe. <laughs> um, um, according to the proper Catholic Christian understanding of meditation, uh, that's not it. <laughs> Meditation is a very active prayer. It requires energy. Um, it requires time. It's something that you do. And by meditation, what a, a good definition I use is to go on a journey. It's the search for God. You look at the world around you. You look at your vocal prayer, something that you've read, something that you've voiced, something that you've seen, and you reflect upon God. Uh, meditation is to look at a mountain and see the grandeur of God. It's to look at the stars and see the intelligence of God. It's to go and to see the different aspects and characteristics of what God, because what we know about creation uh, and everything that is created, including that inspired by human persons, there's something of God in it. That whatever we look at and whatever we see, and of course the human person being the fullest, uh, the highest form of creation, we show forth something of God. I refer to it as the rose window. Now, how many of you have ever been to France? Okay, have you been to the Cathedral of Notre Dame? Yeah. And you've seen the rose window? Um, one of the cool things about the rose window, if you ever get the chance to go there, I've never been, um, but one of the cool things that I've learned about it is that that window will never be repeated in human history. It simply can't. Um, not only by the design of it, but the shade of blue that is found in that window and the way in which it was created and what time itself has done to it, that color of blue will never be repeated. That window stands unique in all of history. In the exact same way that creation itself um, is a rose window. You are a rose window. You have different colors about you, different shades and darknesses, light and dark of those colors. and it shows forth different colors from the sun, different aspects of God, different lights of God. 
So to look at and meditate on a creation or upon scripture is to look through a stained glass window back at the sun. That's what we're doing. And then lastly, contemplation. contemplation. Thank you. Yes. Ordain that man. <laughs> <laughs> contemplation. Now this is one with the universe. This is the moment in which it doesn't require activity. By the understanding of contemplation of the saints, this is a gift from God in which you simply be. Um, I, I like to think of my, my, my grandpa and my grandma. When they were sitting in their living room uh, at their house, they, they would be there without a doubt every night. We went over there like every other night, and they would keep the door unlocked, and we'd walk in, and we would just find them there, sitting in those two specific chairs in their living room, either watching TV or reading a book or something, and it was just funny to hear them, you know, talk about their, their, their nights and evenings because they, they never said two words to each other. Um, that was because that's where they felt comfortable. My grandma and grandpa loved being there with one another, and they felt so comfortable that there was no need to fire up an awkward conversation, just like if I were to meet you on the road or something like that or on the street. Man, how's the weather? How about those chiefs? You know what? Have you ever heard anything about what's going on here? What's that about? There was no need to have a conversation. They were introverts. No, no, they were not introverts. You met my grandpa, you know he's not an introvert. <laughs> he's, he, he is one of those people that he, I didn't ask for advice, but I'm getting it anyway. Um, <laughs> the, uh, it's simply being in that place, knowing that you're loved, knowing that you can be yourself, being very comfortable. When we talk about contemplation, it's not only having that, that, that experience of being comfortable, but it is just simply the fact of recognition that in the grandeur of the universe and everything that God has created and all that time has done, looking back upon the entire history of the cosmos, you're right there and God's loving you. And for a brief moment, you're the only person in the cosmos. At least that's how you feel. And you know, th th this, is, this is the experience of you know, saints like St. Saint Teresa of Avila when the sisters caught her, you know, levitating, literally levitating in the chapel. Um, she was having you know, these moments of contemplation. Now, you're not going to levitate, I don't think. I'm not ruling anything out. <laughs> so, contemplation. Was that the same as Mother Teresa was on the train? I haven't heard that story. Well, that's where she got her, her insight to leave the Sisters of Loretto and become a nun in the, the ghetto. So, enjoy. I believe it. Yeah. <laughs> So, funny connection there. Um, one of uh, Mother Teresa's uh, biggest hero saints, guess who it was? St. Teresa of Avila. So, yeah, maybe they shared the same you know, gifts from God. She chose that name. There we go. All right. One, two, three, four, five. There are five purposes of prayer. According to the Catechism, Adoration, petition, intercession, thanksgiving, and a missing one. Contrition. Praise. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, contrition's not up here. Sorry. Sorry. By blessing and adoration, we acknowledge that we are creatures in the presence of the Creator. Uh, by petition, we cry out needs for ourselves. Intercession, we cry out needs for others. Uh, by thanksgiving, we give praise to God for His uh, bountiful gifts. And in uh, contrition, we um, ask God for forgiveness of our crimes, and we seek, of course, to love Him all the greater. Um, I promise this is all going somewhere when we talk about Lexio Divina. Is there an eraser? Uh, when I saw the, what is sacrament, the Blessed Sacrament, in Adoration? Uh, 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 so, the adoration is a form of the, the Blessed Sacrament, yes. Do we have a, let's do one from another room. Must have you see a napkin? Yeah. Napkin work? We need the water. 
what we believe, how we do things, so that can be better passed on to the generations. Now, this outline takes its shape, takes its form, uh, from the prayers that we receive from the Roman Missal. So, um, number one, all of our prayers, except for a handful, are addressed to God the Father. And in order to accomplish two, we need number three, actually kind of beforehand. Um, and this, actually, number three is filled in with one of these. Adoration, petition, intercession, thanksgiving, or contrition. Um, it's, it's a request, or it's whatever my prayer is. If I want to give thanksgiving to God, if I want to ask God for help, um, and I ask this with confidence based on... <laughs> Action of God. And as we do everything in the church, through Christ our Lord, amen. The great doxology, through him, with him, and in him. Prayers addressed to God the Father. There's an action of God that gives me confidence to make a request. Through Christ our Lord, amen. And our Lord taught us to pray this way. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. I am the narrow gate. I, I am the, you know, the, the eye of the needle that we need to pass through, so we ask everything through Christ our Lord. Amen. So just for example, God the Father, you guided, um, you guided your people Israel through the desert on their pilgrim way. Uh, grant me safety as I go on vacation or as I travel. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Very briefly, it's a nice little summary of how we as a church pray. And I would encourage you to look for this. When you go to, when you go to Mass and you hear the opening prayer, what's also known as the Collect, um, it follows this outline. Most of the prayers the Roman Church do. Now, Lexio Divina itself. Uh, just a quick word of, of the history about it. Origin, uh, one of the Church Fathers, was the first to, to uh, coin the term Lexio Divina. Uh, he, used a, he used a Greek form of it, but it was still called Lexia Divina. And what he did was he stressed the importance of attention, perseverance, and prayer for a contemplative reading of the Bible. Attention, perseverance, and prayer. And this is something that hasn't changed the life of the church. It's not only attention, so giving God you know, a good amount of energy and time to do this, but also <coughs> perseverance. It's not just a one and done, but it's something you do and you come back to time and time and time again. And yes, it is a form of prayer. Uh, from the 3rd century, this became the center of monastic and religious life. Um, the monasteries, of the establishments of St. Pacomia, St. Basil, St. Augustine, and St. Benedict, all within the 3rd century, formed Lectio Divina as an integral, in, in, um, integral, integral part of the monastic life. <laughs> the three things that built them up were liturgy, manual labor, and Lectio Divina. Um, therefore, most of everything that we have comes from the monastic way of doing things. Around the year of 1150, uh, Guido II, a Cartesian monk, wrote a book entitled The Ladder of Monks. And it was here that he really outlined um, the four steps of Lectio Divina. They are reading, meditation, prayer, and contemplation. Reading, meditation, prayer, and contemplation. Now, remember our three ways in which we pray. How cool is that? All three are found in what we do in Lectio Divina. By reading, we are inspecting the scriptures with a docile spirit. Docile, being open to what the Lord has to say to us. By meditation, it's the consecrated application of the mind 
to investigate with the help of reason the undertakings that are found in, in, in this truth. So as I said, go on a journey. Go looking for God. Prayer, the fervent inclination of the heart to God so as to avoid evil and obtain that which is good. And then contemplation is the elevation of the mind, uh, the raising of the mind, not by me, but by God, the raising of my mind, uh, to be fixed on God and taste the joys of eternal sweetness. Now, yeah. Dusty, um, what time do we need to be done? Uh, mass is at 11.30, so usually we try to leave a little break before Mass. Um, so 10 or 15 after 11. Okay, I want you to stop me in 15 minutes. Uh, that way we can actually do a practice of Lexio. Okay. Um, okay. This book. This is probably um, the best book I have yet, I have found on Lexio Vina, written by Father Gabriel in this today. Um, he does a, a full-blown introduction and um, walks through the steps of Lexio Divina. I pass that around briefly. You guys want to write down the author? Um, this also is very um, excellent. This is put out by the Midwest Theological Forum. It's called the Handbook of Prayers, Student Edition. Uh, don't be um, discouraged by the title student. We are all students in the eyes of God. Own it. Um, I use this thing. It's, it's probably one of the, the, the best books that um, I have as far as an introduction to prayer, how to integrate prayer um, into your life. So. Uh, yeah, th those two books, if you want to write those down, absolutely um, incredible for this process. I love that book because it simplifies a lot of things. So, the first thing that we need to discuss when we start talking about doing Lexia Divina is setting and preparation. Before I... Um, well, actually, during the time I was teaching in high school, up until about uh, six months ago, I was acting as the, as the master of ceremonies for the diocese. So my background is liturgy and, and scripture. And um, one of the coined phrases I had during that time as an MC is, I, and I told all my servers this, and I told all the seminarians this, is like, guys, when you're setting up for a big liturgy and a big mass, uh, preparation is 70% of what you do. 70% of what you do. Therefore, if you completely botch the liturgy, you still get a C. It's still good. Or a B if you went to public school. Um, <laughs> but uh, setting and preparation is 70% of what you do. And you know, as far as preparation, what I mean here is making sure that you are making yourself available to the Lord. Ideally, according to uh, that book that's being passed around, this is if you're doing it individually, you want 20 to 50 minutes. Um, obviously, as you're first starting out, you want to set aside for yourself 15 to 20 minutes uh, to do Lectio Divina because it is going to take a little bit to get into it. But what you'll notice is over time, as you do it more and more and more, you're going to start spending a lot more time into it because you're going to start to have experiences of contemplation more often. And I'll tell you right now, when you have that experience of contemplation, you never forget it because you sit there for 10 minutes and then you get up to leave the chapel and you look down at your watch and it's been four hours. I'm not joking about that. So, ideally what you're doing is you're set aside, setting aside 20 to 15 minutes. Um, which is, if you have a holy hour somewhere in the diocese in Adoration Chapel, perfect. Absolutely perfect. It gives you time to do your, your introduction prayers, uh, to kind of set the stage, and then you open up the scripture and really dive into it. If this were a monastery, um, and we were all religious, Doing this as a communal event, you would actually be setting aside 60 to 90 minutes. Uh, just because in a communal setting, it takes on it takes a little bit more time. But if I may encourage you, you know, when you start the practice of Lectio Divina, and quite frankly, it is something that I would highly encourage you to do. Um, I do spiritual direction for some of my students and others, and all two of them, um, I make them do Lectio Divina. Uh, and, 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 I, and I make them write down what they learn or what they experience from, uh, from what they pray about. Because when we talk about sacred scripture, it's the way in which God interacts with us. And I'll get back to that in a minute. But making sure to write things down. Um, for us laity, though, this is probably not a practice that can be done every single day. Um, so what I would encourage you to do 
is if you really want to dive into this, and Pope Bennett, and, you know, he was the one who really kind of drove this home, that getting back to praying with the scriptures, um, and a direct quote from him, that is what is what is going to usher in the new springtime of evangelization, uh, the new springtime of the church. Um, so I, I would really highly encourage you, make this a weekly goal. Um, yes? I'm understanding everything you're saying, but one of my biggest questions has always been, when Jesus prayed, what did he say? What did he do? What did you do? Uh, and you just kind of brought that up to mind. Do you pray with the scriptures? Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? Um, I, we're we're going to walk through that process of how we pray with the scriptures. I'm, I'm going to go through all four steps. So, yeah, I will explain that. Um, so, setting aside 20 to 50 minutes, when you do this, uh, remember the story of Cain and Abel. Uh, set aside the best time, all right? Don't, don't set aside the time where you're done working at the end of the day and you're tired. And if you get, I mean, I don't know about you, if I get 20 to 50 minutes just to sit down, I'm gone. So, I need to get a cup of coffee beforehand, uh, sometimes during, and um, I need to sit down and open up the scriptures. So making sure you set aside a very ideal time, uh, you know, one of the best times you have. Location. Find a place that is conducive to prayer. Your room, a church, a chapel. Um, if it helps you, and again, this is just according to your own practicality, maybe you put a candle in the center of the room, something to help you, you know, to focus. Um, but you want to maintain a balanced position wherever you are. You don't want to be slouching to the point that you're falling asleep. But you don't want to be sitting up tight so uncomfortable that the only thing you can think about is that you're uncomfortable. Chosen text. Um, when deciding how you want to pray with Lexi and Mina, um, there's some options. Uh, one of the ones that was made popular during my time in high school was just open up the Bible. Just see what it says. Just randomly throw open a passage. Um, over the years, I have um, learned to develop a kind of better way uh, of doing this is that when there was so, there's something on my mind over the you know over a course of a week or longer, uh, a specific subject. So maybe I'm going through a moment where I'm lacking in faith, or I'm having trouble forgiving somebody, or I need strength, um, or I want to dwell on the fact of righteousness. Well, we can look up a subject and find passages associated with that subject. Um, you can do a Google search with this. Um, chances are you're probably going to come up with a, with a Christian text. Uh, or a Protestant text form of the Bible, uh, but that doesn't mean you can't find it you know, in the Catholic book. So maybe it's a specific subject that you want to look at, and so it's a specific passage you want to pray with. I personally, though, very much highly recommend let the church decide that for you. If you are going to make this a weekly experience, um, focus on this coming Sunday's passage. In a sense, you are actually preparing yourself for a more fruitful celebration of what's going to happen on Sunday. And the other thing that you can do is select readings based on the liturgical year. So during ordinary time, you simply focus on the readings and all four Gospels that are based on you know, the coming of the Kingdom, the preaching of the Gospel. During Lent, you look into the passages all about sacrifice. There's sacrifice in the Old, the Gospel, and the New. It's all there. So find passages that are specifically related to that. Let the church kind of decide for you um, how you want to pray and what you want to pray with. And then, of course, we begin by invoking the Holy Spirit. So after you found your place, after you found your passage, you're going to start by invoking the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, for the hearts of your faithful. Enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Um, we do this because... The same Holy Spirit that inspired this Word, that made this happen, the Word of God present in our midst, is the same Holy Spirit that dwells within you as a temple. This was the great gift of baptism. The same, it's having the author in your back pocket. He's right there. And part of what that's going to do is it's going to help you become docile to what the Lord wants to say to you. And part of that is, is... The, the setting the stage for the reading. So what you're going to do is you're going to open up your Bible passage and you're going to read it for the first time.
Yes, I keep this Bible in a box. Is that a new Sunday Bible? Huh? Is that a new Sunday Bible? No, New American. I do have a copy of the New Jerusalem. I think it's fantastic. Um, this was a Bible presented to me on the day I was made lector. So I hope to keep this in pretty good condition for the rest of my life. But all things being fair, if you don't buy four Bibles in the course of your lifetime, you didn't use it enough. So, um, so you're going to open up the passage. You're going to you're going to read through it once. Now the first time you read through it, um, I'm, you're not speed reading it. But what you're going to do is you're actually just going to kind of read through it with a blank mind. You, the idea is is you're going to come to your setting. You're going to sit with your gospel passage, and you got a lot of different things going through your mind. What time do I need to pick up the kids? What time do I need to run this errand? I got to get this, this, and this done. Dusty, what's for lunch today? Nobody cares. All right, God doesn't care. It's about giving this time, dedicating it, sanctifying it to the Lord. And so, when the first time you read through it, it sets the mood. Uh, it, it, it's kind of a washing clear of the mind. You read through it once so that your mind becomes blank. Uh, th th this is supposed to be an intimate dialogue. And it also, it's, it's a given reminder that, you know, yeah, this is the divine word of God. This is supposed to be a transformative experience. This is supposed to be a word that changes my life. So it's a, it's a clearing of the mind. It's setting the mood. Barry Manilow's got nothing on the Holy Spirit. Um, <coughs> after you read through it once, give it a moment of silence. If you still got things blowing through your head, read through it one more time. Go through it however many times you need to clear the mind. And then, uh, if, you, if it's your second time or whenever, when you're truly ready to begin, you're going to read through the text, and you're going to read through it slowly. What are some of the general objectives of this passage? What does it affirm? What does it reject? What does it question? What does it strengthen? What does it tear down? What's happening in the passage that I'm reading? And I want you to think of this in two ways, general and individual. In a very general sense, what is God accomplishing in this text, in, in, in what I am reading, this specific passage, what's the goal? And also, to include with that, you know, maybe to give a little context, I need to look at the passage that came before. I need to look at the passage that comes after. Where does this fit in Scripture? Where does this fit if you're reading a passage in the Old Testament? Where does this fit in the, in, in the timeline of the Israelites? If you're reading in the New Testament, where does this fit in the time of the Apostles? What's going on? What's happening? These are all important things to take into account. So you're going to think in a good general sense. If you want any kind of help with that, there's really only two books you ever need, Bible and the Catechism. If you don't have either in your home, let me know. I'll be happy to purchase you one. I tell that to my students. So guys, in 15 years, if you're happily married with a family and kids, and I come over to your house and you don't have a Bible or a catechism, I'm going to burn your house down. Yep, <laughs> <laughs> burning it down. <laughs> yes, yes. But, and and we'll, we'll, we'll do that when we, okay. when we correct you through. In the back of the catechism, there's an index of citations. If this is something that you need to help you, believe it or not, uh, like so the passage we're going to do today is this coming uh, Sunday's Gospel. You look at Mark, and you look at um, 10, chapter 10, what we're going to go through today. There's a list of paragraph references. So it's helpful to think general in this way. You can actually find the passage and look back at what Holy Mother Church itself has taken from these passages. And maybe it gives you a little insight about how you should be approaching uh, this, pa this passage, what you should really be thinking about uh, if you want to find a good commentary from one of the church fathers or the saints, feel free to do that. Um, the idea is to get a good general sense. And then the meat. The true, kind of in my opinion, the, the, this is where the, the, the rubber meets the road. You think in a general sense. You get these principles, you get the teachings of the church, or the sayings of the saints in your head, and then you read through it again. So by this time, you're on your third or your fourth or your fifth try. And you've got to have this approach of what is God saying to me? 
which is absolutely important. Because God is talking to you. It's Christmas morning. You're running downstairs. You look under your tree, and there's nothing there except this book. It's the only thing left for you. It's specifically gifted for you. It's got your name on it. If you were the only person... Uh, I, I went to seminary for seven years. If I had walked out of seminary, got ordained a priest, heard one confession, and then had a heart attack and died, it would have been worth it. If God had become man, if he had to go through the entire history of the people of Israel again, if he had to endure all his passion and suffering and everything that he went through, just for you to get this, it would have happened. In a heartbeat. There was no question about that. So you thought in the general sense of what this gospel is saying to all of humanity. Now what is it saying to you in particular? Because God does have a message for you. And this is where you actually perhaps maybe think about those things that you were thinking about earlier. What are my cares right now? What's the concerns that are happening in the world? What's the concerns that are happening in my life? And what is this passage saying to me? And very specifically, how this is going to work is you're going to write something down that sticks out at you. A detail, a character, a setting. You know, a, a word that's repeated multiple times. Why is it, oh, thank you. Why is it repeated multiple times? What's the significance of it? Why did that catch my attention? Answer those questions. And then you're going to take that and you're going to apply it to what you've already learned in the general sense. By looking at this in these details, in these particulars, and spending some time with what the Lord will, will, will grab your attention, you're going to start to realize something very specific that God was trying to tell you. Maybe in this moment he's asking you to have more trust. Maybe in this moment he's trying to teach you that you know, maybe you need to be more welcoming to others. What follows the period of meditation is contemplation. Or, I'm sorry, what follows the period of, uh, of meditation is prayer. And this is actually where it gets pretty cool. Because then you pray with the mindset of the church. You look at the passage and you say, God the Father, you healed the blind man. I also ask for sight. I request clarity on this, you know, this really tough decision I have to make in my life. Through Christ our Lord, amen. You formulate your own prayer. You give adoration to God for a blessing. You make a petition. You ask for something for somebody else. You offer thanksgiving for a, for a blessing, or you know you are sorry for a sin that you may have committed. So, to that point, um, what I want to do now is I want to just have, take take a nice kind of twenty minutes and walk through Alexia <coughs> and kind of show you how this would look and what this would look like. So, the uh, gospel is Mark chapter 10. Get in to a balanced position, semi-comfortable, not too slouchy, not too, uncom uh, not too uncomfortable. Make sure to check yourself. Feel free to move around if you need to. In the name of the Father. The Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. 
fill the hearts of your faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Remember, the first time you read through it, forget everything that's happening in the world. They came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples, a sizable crowd, and a sizable crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind man, the son of Timaeus, sat by the roadside begging. On hearing that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have pity on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he kept calling out all the more, Son of David, have pity on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called the blind man, saying to him, Take courage, get up, he is calling you. He threw aside his cloak, sprang up, and came to Jesus. Jesus said to him in reply, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man replied to him, Master, I want to see. Jesus told him, Go your way, your faith has saved you. Immediately he, re immediately he received his son and followed him on the way. God trying to accomplish in telling me this passage. They came to Jericho, and as he was leaving, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a sizable crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind man, the son of Timaeus, sat by the roadside begging. On hearing that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have pity on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he kept calling out all the more, Son of David, have pity on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called the blind man, saying to him, Take courage, get up, he is calling you. He threw aside his cloak, sprang up, and came to Jesus. Jesus said to him in reply, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man replied to him, Master, I want to see. Jesus told him, Go your way, your faith has saved you. Immediately he received his sight and followed him on the way. passage that we just read is very clearly um, it's actually referenced in the citations uh, for the catechism paragraph 2667 the paragraph says this simple invocation of faith developed in the tradition of prayer under many forms in the east and the west 
the most usual formulation transmitted by the spiritual writers of Sinai, Syria, Mount Athos, is the invocation, Lord Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on us sinners. It combines a Christological hymn from Philippians with the cry of the publican and the blind man begging for sight. By it, the heart is open to human wretchedness and the Savior of mercy. By the blind man crying out, God was made aware of human wretchedness. And he was made able to give his mercy. What virtue, what action does this passage affirm? What vice does it tear down? If you need to, look at the passages that come before to figure out where this lies. Look at the passage that comes after to give it its context of where we're at in Jesus' ministry. something that everyone who reads this passage should take away from it. Everyone. Is it faith in Jesus? Is it, is it crying out to God? Perseverance in crying out to God? Now, if you need to write it down, feel free to do so. And read through it again if you need to. And in fact, I'm going to do that here briefly. But what detail in this passage sticks out of you? What character catches your eye, catches your attention, makes you feel something? So hear the words again. They came to Jericho. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a sizable crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind man, the son of Timaeus, sat by the roadside begging. On hearing that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have pity on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he kept calling out all the more, Son of David, have pity on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called the blind man, saying to him, Take courage, get up, he is calling you. And he threw aside his cloak, sprang up, and came to Jesus. Jesus said to him in reply, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man replied to him, Master, I want to see. Jesus told him, Go your way. Your faith has saved you. Immediately he received his sight and followed him on the way.
Detail that catches your attention is what you know something you need to spend some time with. Because now that you have your detail, um, what does this make you feel? Yeah. yeah. Does it you cause have you? Faith. you have faith, the Lord will help you. Indeed. Does it cause you any doubt? Because Quite frankly, as with every passage of scripture, there's a lot to possibly take away here. For those of you that saw the word Jericho, that grabbed your attention, well, the great walls of Jericho fell before God in the Old Testament. With persistence in the prayer around. What follows this passage? It's when he was entering into Jerusalem. Where God accomplished an amazing task by defeating the walls of Jericho. Jesus, with a sizable crowd, much like Moses, or I'm sorry, uh, Joshua, with a large contingent of the chosen people, was entering the promised land, establishing a new kingdom. Jesus was leaving Jericho on his way to Jerusalem to do just that. Compassion with Bartimaeus. He was blind. We don't even know if this man was blind from birth. For all we know, he his blindness came later on in life. He went through the process of seeing and then not seeing. And now he got it back. He has ever lost something, an object, a feeling. An experience, maybe a childhood emotion or something that you thought was lost forever, and in the moment you got it back. Can you share with that experience? He was on the roadside begging. Have you ever felt so desperate in your entire life? Maybe not for food or for money, but maybe just for attention. Son of David, I've stated twice. What's the significance there? Why is it important for Jesus to be known as Son of David? ever been against you? A task or something you wanted? And many told him to be quiet. Many told him to shut up. I'm sure a lot of us have had that experience before. Maybe we ourselves were, were those voices. Maybe at a portion in our life I was with a crowd persecuting somebody else. And also he found the poor. And the Lord said, the poor will always be with us. Mm -hmm. He must have followed him into Jerusalem. And he 
actually states very specifically that right at the end, followed him along the way. Maybe there's some lingering questions about Bartimaeus. So it says they followed him on the way, but he was also one of the last to be healed in the Gospel of Mark. He's one of the last people to experience a miracle of God. So when the crucifixion came, was he there? Or did he abandon like the others? Was he there, Father? I don't know. But maybe that's a question you want to think about. Because it says something to you, about you, maybe. Were you part? Of, were you ever part of a group that inspired somebody? You were telling them, "Get up, answer the Lord's call." Have you ever felt the anticipation that Bartimaeus did? He threw off his cloak, sprang up. Desperately wanting something from the Lord. Master, I want to see. As I gave the example earlier, maybe it's clarity about a particular issue. I want to see things as God sees. Jesus already knew that he was blind, and yet he asked him, What do you want him to do for you? Why did he question? For the why we pray. That's one of the beautiful things to reflect upon. Jesus knows what we need. Yes. He wants us to ask. Mm -hmm. He wants us to draw close. <clears throat> I like to take courage. Take courage. Take courage. So the question that follows that, okay, what was he afraid of? Maybe he was afraid of approaching Jesus. Maybe he was afraid of the fact that he had just had a bunch of people turned down. <coughs> what about Jesus? Feel like him? Jesus was leaving Jericho, a high moment, sizable crowd at his back, on his way to Jerusalem to accomplish some great task. And then somebody stops and bugs him. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sorry. I have a meaning to get to. <laughs> <laughs> but he didn't get his brother. He was not irritated. But how many of us have been on our way to something and somebody has made a request of us? Did we stop and answer their plea? Did we stop and help them out? But he didn't go to him. He said, call him. He came to him. Yeah. He didn't just walk over to him. Uh -huh. Maybe that's a detail that you know that kind of sticks out. Yeah. So what does that mean? It does, I mean, very specifically, I mean, at the very least, Jesus had to stop and get that man over here. Go your way. Your faith has saved you. How we long for those words. Enter my kingdom. Your faith has saved you. Immediately he received his sight and followed him on the way. Jesus answered this man's prayer. And what happened afterwards was this man followed Christ. Maybe Jesus knew that if this man received this gift, he would follow him. Maybe that gives an insight to whenever we make an asking a request of the Lord. Is this going to help me to follow Christ better? Or is this just something I need at this moment? It's kind of interesting, too. He says, go your way. He doesn't say follow me. That's what yeah. he does. Yeah. So it had to be his choice mm -hmm. to follow 
whatever detail that grabbed your attention, ask yourself the question of why. And as you start to figure out what the Lord was revealing to you, you're going to start to come to some conclusions. If I was the crowd who tore down this person, I need to be a little bit more compassionate. Maybe there's an inspiration there to seek out that person that I tore down and, you know, offer them help or ask for forgiveness. Maybe you feel like the busyness of your life, you're accomplishing so many tasks that you kind of make, you are aware by reading this passage that, you know, I've got a lot going on, but I don't take a moment to help people, the closest those are those around me. And, and as people who live in a family, that's one of your primary obligations, is to be there for them, as Christ was for us. So, petition. Maybe I need to ask God for a little bit more patience, a little bit more willingness to help. Thanksgiving. God the Father, you gave clarity to the blind man. Thank you for that moment last week when I saw things so clearly I knew exactly what decision had to be made at that moment at that time. You're going to start to formulate your own prayer. Finish this process of praying. Maybe offer a quick word of thanksgiving. But then, to hopefully it is God's will to give you this moment of contemplation, you simply rest in what you have been given. This grace, this inspiration, the Holy Spirit acting within you. Just the exact same way the Holy Spirit acted and the authors who wrote these very pages. God working in your life. God not abandoning you. Be in that moment. Son, to the Holy Spirit. <coughs> Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, a couple things to remember when doing Lexio Divina. Um, obviously, you know, like I said, setting aside time. If you're looking at the Old Testament, um, which again, yeah, I mean, the entire scripture is open for, you know, it's open for business. Uh, make sure when you, you think of the general sense of the Old Testament, remember general versus individual, remember the Old Testament in light of the new. Uh, what is the Old Testament building towards? Uh, that's that's kind of one of the cool things to look back in the Old Testament and have a realization, wow, I see Christ in this, or I see St. Paul's message uh, in this. Um, and when you read the New Testament, so St. Paul, John, Peter, all of the, the, you know, the Catholic letters, um, make sure to see in light of what came before. How Paul sees it, and this is one of the reasons why, you know, Paul is really very much included in the uh, prayer life of the scriptures of the church is because Paul saw the whole picture. 
I was growing up as you know a young up and coming Pharisee, uh, one of the great you know preachers of his day as far as you know the Jew Jewish faith, knowing the knowing the Old Testament kind of forwards and backwards, and then seeing Jesus and how he fulfilled all these things. Now Paul has a very you know broad look as far as looking at all of creation and uh, how things have built up to the person of Jesus Christ, and that's the message he conveys. Um, so. Whichever way, you know, seeing it from the past, seeing it from the future, uh, make sure you do that. Um, uh, one of the reasons why I always tell, you know, use the catechism as a point of reference is to make sure to see whatever you're reading. Also, take an opportunity to see it in the general sense of the entirety of scriptures. Um, too often throughout the course of history, people have taken, you know, individual lines uh, from the Bible and developed a theology around that one line that turns out to be very wrong. Um, so you need to make sure you see this passage in light of the whole. Um, hmm. Any other questions about Lexia Divina? It takes practice, I'm assuming. It takes practice. I'm, I'm, still, wor I, I'm still working my way into it. So, I mean, it's, and, you know, like I said, Pope Benedict said this is going to usher in a new springtime. Um, and as I talked about earlier, you know, the first time you do this, it's probably going to be 15 minutes. Uh, it's, you know, 20 minutes. But as you progress with it, and as you persevere over time, you, you know, you'll become more aware. And if that's not to say that every time you pick this thing up, you're going to have this amazing insider holy inspiration. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, you know, for the exact same reason, you know, we do this. The most important thing about prayer is just simply that we do it. Uh, when, you know, mom wants me to vacuum the kitchen, or, or vacuum the, the living room, does she care whether or not I get anything out of it? <laughs> no. <laughs> Um, she cares that I did it because that's the action of love. And just by making yourself available uh, to God in this moment, even if you take you know nothing away from it, the very action of setting aside time for prayer, of setting aside time for a loved one, you know, my mom, you know, she, she knows that I love her. But, you know, when I remember, you know, her birthday and, you know, I send her flowers on Mother's Day and I visit her, you know, whenever as much as I can, and I let her know that she's worth my time. Whew. Ask her who her favorite son is. <laughs>